you have your Bibles, you can turn with me in them this morning to Genesis 18. Looking at verses 16 through 30, this morning, a God of justice. We've been walking through Genesis and being introduced to the God whose pages it describes. He is outside of time, space, and matter, making him omniscient, omnipresent, omnipotent. He created the living universe, showing his creativity. He made man in his own image after his likeness, which means the nature of man is reflective of the nature of his creator, teaching us about God's personality, the aspects of intellect, of emotion, and of will. In that God did not destroy Adam and Eve after their fall, after his rebellion, we saw God's mercy. In that God did not destroy Noah in the flood, We saw God's grace in God's personal interactions with Abraham. We have seen him as a personal God. So personal, in fact, he was willing to bind himself without condition to Abraham on the basis of Abraham's faith. So personal, in fact, that last week we we saw him, the Lord, uh, eat and, and to drink in the tents of Abraham. God presented himself to Abraham as man's shield and his exceeding great reward. God has presented himself through Hagar to us as the God who sees and knows us each individually. And then the last couple of weeks, we have seen God present himself to Abraham, last week to Sarah, as the almighty God for whom nothing is too hard. This week, we come to a heightened insight into the character of God's justice. Now, God's justice is not necessarily a new lesson for us. We think particularly of the days of Noah, where the earth was filled with violence and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. And God's justice demanded judgment upon that wicked world. And indeed, God did judge that wicked world, cleansing the world of the deep depravity which had consumed it by bringing a flood which destroyed man and beast. But as, of course, we recall from that account, God did not destroy all men upon the earth, for Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And at that time, what we learned within rational context is that God is gracious to mankind. And we also saw hints of the reason why this grace fell upon Noah, Genesis 6, 9, telling us that Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and that Noah walked with God. So Noah was a man of obedience. But yet it was the grace of God that then compelled God to spare Noah. It wasn't necessarily anything in himself, but rather it was God's grace. And I just use several terms that we in the church use regularly, but it's important that we regularly define them as well. When the Bible says that Noah was a perfect man, this does not mean that Noah was a sinless man. That is not what the word perfect means in our Bibles. In our King James Bibles, the word perfect does not mean sinless. The word perfect does not mean flawless. The word perfect means finished or complete, having everything that is necessary to one's nature or to one's kind. So Noah was a man who was in that sense, a man who walked in that finished nature because of his understanding of the Lord. The fact that he walked with God meant that he had that that completedness of a relationship with God. That thing that is missing from us when we are born because of the sin of Adam, wherein we are in our sin, because we are born separated from the living God uh, through our sin, we, we are incomplete. And Noah was a man who, through his faith, was a completed man, a man who had been restored in his walk with the Lord, who had been restored to that state whereby he was uh, um, unified with his creator and his God. That is what it meant that Noah was a perfect man. When the Bible uses the word grace, Grace, by definition, is that it rests outside of the idea of merit. Grace, in fact, is defined as unmerited favor. It's when we are given something that we do not deserve, unmerited favor. So when the Bible talks about all that God would do for and through Noah, the contemplation is not about Noah being a man who did all the right things and so was deserving of anything, including deserving of being spared from judgment, but rather that God had given him something, that because Noah exercised faith, he was a just and perfect man. It was because he had faith in God that then he was completed by being restored in his relationship with God, and it was that gift that God had given to him of that restoration, of that, of that, that, that reinitiation with his creator that then put him in the place where God would give him grace 
to spare him from the destruction with the wicked. So Noah found this grace in the eyes of the Lord, and due to Noah's faith, he was not destroyed, along with those who were wicked in that day. And we saw this theme, but we didn't really rest on that theme that Noah was not destroyed with the wicked. We talked about grace in that day, and we talked about judgment in that day, but we didn't really speak about this idea of why it was God spared Noah, and we didn't rest on it because the text didn't rest on that theme. And the text didn't rest on that theme in that day, but it most certainly does rest upon that theme today in Genesis 18. And by the theme that I'm talking about, I mean the idea that when God judges the wicked, he does not destroy the righteous with the wicked. So that when we say that God is just, the idea of God's justice is just as much about who God does not judge as about who, as it is about who God does judge. And this is, in fact, the theme of the interaction that we see today. So you're there in Genesis 18. We're beginning in verse 16, picking up where we left off last week. The Bible says this, And the men arose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. So recall our context from last time. Three men appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre, and the Bible introduces this event as uh, the, uh, the, the, the person uh, who was there, or the people that were there, as the Lord appearing before Abraham. So we would presume, based upon the previous context, Hagar and her interaction with the angel of the Lord, that most likely this is, these three are one of them, the angel of the Lord, and then two other men with him. And as we continue in the context, we presume, again, these are some, somewhat uh, assumption-based, but we presume that those two men are the two men that the Lord will then send into Sodom And we'll talk about that next week as we get into Genesis 19. So these three men appear. The Lord appears unto Abraham. Abraham feeds these men. They sit with him. And the Lord reiterates his promise to Abraham in the ears of Sarah this time that Sarah would have a child in her old age. And of course, we go through the interaction where Sarah laughs in her heart and and, and the back and forth as we talked about last time. This is where we pick up then, these men having eaten, having told Abraham, reiterated this promise to Abraham, they now get up and they continue along their way. Recall that Abraham kind of um, um, uh, grabbed them in the way, right? They were heading somewhere. Abraham stopped them uh, along the way, met them and, and offered them that hospitality. So the Bible says that they rise up having eaten and they look toward Sodom, meaning that they directed themselves in the direction of the city Of Sodom. And as they depart, the Bible says Abraham escorts them out a ways uh, from his tents. We pick up, we continue then in verses 17 through 19. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. So the Lord then speaks uh, to these other men. And it is here that we have more evidence that one of these men is in fact the Lord. We have called him from Genesis 16, again, the angel of the Lord. And we then thus presume that the angel of the Lord is speaking to the two other men that are with him and ask them, shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I shall do? And the reason he gives as to why he would not hide this thing from Abraham is somewhat interesting. He says that Abraham would surely become a great and a mighty nation and that all the nations of the earth would be blessed in him. The promise having been given going all the way back to Genesis chapter 12 as we've studied for some months. And while this assurance is rooted in God's gracious promise, we find that the reason why God gave this gracious promise is because God knew that Abraham was a man of justice, a man of judgment, that he would command, command his household to do the same. And it was because God knew that these men would be faithful men, not flawless men, not sinful men, not men of correction, not men above error, but faithful men, that God would be able to bring upon Abraham all of the things that he had promised. And in this, we find something of God's nature as it relates to those early attributes that we studied of God's omniscience, of God's omnipotence, and of God's omnipresence. Omniscience, meaning he is all-knowing. Omnipotence, meaning he is all-powerful. Omniscience, uh, uh, I said omniscience already. Uh, um, Omnipresence, meaning that he is all-everywhere, right, in all places. He is not in everything, and 
in, in the, the pagan idea that God is in the flowers and in the bees and in the trees and such. Um, but he is everywhere, omnipresent. God made promises to Abraham on the basis of what God knew Abraham and his sons would do. And we call this omniscience. Uh, we would call this to some degree as well sovereignty. But we are careful when we speak of that word sovereignty because it has numerous definitions depending on who you talk to in the church today. As we look at this idea of the way that God expresses to Abraham or of Abraham these things, we see that the fact that God knew Abraham and his sons would do these things does not necessarily demand or even imply that God caused them to happen. As I said, in much of the modern church today, the definition of God being sovereign over all things demands in their minds that God is the one who thus causes things to happen. That nothing happens outside of God's knowledge and control demands in this idea that nothing happens outside of God's will or decree. And this is by no means a natural, logical necessity. It does not follow that because God knows what happens that this by necessity demands that God makes it happen. It does not follow that because all things are under God's direct authority. This does not necessarily demand that all things are under God's direct control. And this idea of sovereignty, perhaps better defined, depending on who you talk to, as determinism, is not necessarily what, what I believe the Bible presents as it relates to the way God deals with men. And I think this is a good passage to show that. The Bible reflects that God has given men free will. He has ordained in his sovereignty that man have the ability to do as he would choose, even if that defies the direct will of God, contradicts or, or, or even rejects God. Now, it never happens outside of God's authority. It never happens outside of God's overarching design. God is still the one in authority, but as with my children, I can give them the authority. I can under, within my authority, give them the right or give them the opportunity or the chance to make a decision that whereby they might even go against my will or my desire for them. So too, we see God regularly doing this within the scriptures. Now, there are always consequences when man does so, when man uh, operates against God's authority, when man operates against God's design, and, and that's because God is still in authority. God still uh, has a design, but man has this choice, and his choices are limited by God's broader will, by God's timeless decrees. God's uh, broader will and timeless decrees will never be subverted by any man's individual actions, though he may try. Yet he still can reject God's design. In love and hate, in truth and lies, in giving and receiving, his choices are limited by God's broader will and timeless decrees, but he still has his choices in hand. None of this, however, threatens God's design. So that the broader implications of God's intent and will in this world are absolutely unassailable by any man or any society or even any spiritual entity. But the individual decisions, who aligns and who rejects, how that affects individual groups, these things fall within the purview of man's free will as we see it in the scriptures. And God can do this. The reason why it is possible that God can do this, that God can know what's going to happen without directly saying that, without directly controlling the thoughts and the actions of man, without falling into absolute determinism, is because God is outside of the system. He is above time. He is above space. He is above matter. He is as much in the future as he is in the past. He is not linear as we are linear. He does not have to live in time or be bound by time as we live in time and are bound by time, which makes it fully consistent for God to be able to weave history together to bring about his perfect and absolute will while still allowing humanity itself to have their choices intact without falling into the temptation to say that everything is absolutely deterministic and to be one of just a couple of groups in the world that, that, that reject the idea that man has a free will. It's basically theological determinists and atheists. They're the only two that don't believe that man has a free will. And so it is fully consistent for him to weave history together because God knows the decisions people will make based upon the times and the seasons and the circumstances that they are in. 
without us having to fall into those ideas that state that the only way God could possibly know how history will unfold is if he forced it to unfold that way, thus stripping from men any vestige of free will and turning us into pawns in some divine simulation. I really like the way A.W. Tozer described the interplay between God's sovereignty and free will. He likened God's sovereignty uh, and man's free will to an ocean liner that was crossing between New York and London. And the individual passengers on the ship have no control over their destination. It will go from point A to point B without their control, without their input, without their ability to influence. Whether they were on the boat or not on the boat, regardless of what they do on the boat, it is going to go from point A to point B and nothing is going to stop that. But what they as individuals do on that ship as going from point A to point B is certainly within their own power and at their own discretion. Yes, there are locked doors into which they can't enter even if they wanted to. Yes, there are ordained meal times which they can't affect so that if they miss the meal time, then they don't get to eat for that meal time. Yes, there are set times for various events which if they miss them, they miss them. Yes, there is a code of conduct and, and there are consequences for breaching that code of conduct on that boat, but as a general rule, they are free to do as they will within the bounds that are set on the boat. And how they act or react will not change the destination of the ship, the timing of reaching that destination. Each of individual's decisions will only affect the disposition into which they arrive at the destination. The boat's going from point A to point B, but what they get to affect is how they arrive at the destination and the, the people that they interacted with in between. And I think this is an excellent, if not simple, I, uh, illustration of the interplay between God's sovereignty and man's free will. God is deterministic as it relates to his broader will. He has written it in the scriptures. He has told us it will be so, and it most certainly will be so. But man is fully within, the, uh, is fully free, excuse me, within that broader will of God, deterministic will of God, to make co choices that are contrary to God's will, to choose for or against the Lord's will and design. To that end, we find here a God who knew full well the decisions that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob would make in their lives. And because they would be men of justice and judgment, because God knew that it would be so, God chose Abraham even before he made those decisions to become the father of many nations. God did not force Abraham to make these decisions. God did not override Abraham in these decisions. Abraham has certainly made enough mistakes for us to know that God isn't overriding him, right? He's made a lot of mistakes here. But because God is already, he's already in the future as he's already in the past, God is above time. Uh, we think of time as, as, as one direction in linear. God stands above time and he sees the beginning. He sees the end. He sees it all. At the same time, he, has, he is already in eternity future with those who have come to him by faith as he is in eternity past. Because God is not bound by time. He created time in the beginning. God knows tomorrow just as he knows today, just as he knows yesterday. He knew the decisions Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would make. He knew what he would need to do to guide those decisions into fruition, and it was because of the decisions that they would make that God chose him to be the inheritor of these blessings. Had God looked into the future and seen that Abraham and his sons would not have been faithful men, God would have chosen some other man to do the work. But God knew Abraham that he would command his children and his household after him, that they would keep the way of the Lord to do justice and to do judgment. And God knew that he could make these promises to Abraham and that in the day that those promises came to pass, Abraham would be the kind of man that was qualified to receive them. One more thing before we move on. The question comes up, why does the character of Abraham and his posterity compel the Lord to reveal what he's about to reveal? Why did God feel compelled to tell Abraham what was about to happen here? And that's a good question. Now, what is about to happen is they're about to, the Lord's about to send two angels into Sodom and Gomorrah to confirm what the cry that has gone out from them, we'll see in a few verses, and then he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah with fire. And so we, we recognize that that is a, what is about to happen. Why is it that God felt compelled to tell Abraham this thing? And there's a few theories as to why this might be. Some theorize it's because Abraham was to be given the land. 
So God felt compelled to tell Abraham what he was about to do concerning the land because the land was as good as his by promise. Now, this seems unlikely to me because Abraham was still 400 years out from inheriting the land. And one of the things we see about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the Lord does not run every decision about the land by them as he's doing things. So it seems unlikely that that's the reason. Some have theorized it's because Abraham was the man through whom all the families of the earth would be blessed, the distant father of Jesus Christ. And so perhaps God presumed that Abraham would be personally interested in everything that was happening among humanity regarding this blessing and this judgment. And this seems unlikely to me as well. As we might presume that even Abraham's concern for the city rests not necessarily in the wicked man and their king and the wicked people that are there. We've already seen Abraham interact with Sodom on a couple, or at least on one, on one occasion, and it was not a positive interaction necessarily. We presume that probably the reason why Abraham is, is concerned in the physical is because his nephew's there, Lot. The, 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 the man that he had raised up, that he had effectively adopted when Lot's father died, who he brought into the land with him, and of course, Lot's family. To this end, some believe that God wanted to tell Abraham because he knew how much Abraham cared for his nephew Lot and wanted to warn him about the impending doom that Lot would very possibly be caught up in. And this is certainly more plausible. I think this is a fine explanation for why it might be, but, but still not the one I favor. I think the text uh, is, I, I, think, I think there's a more simple explanation than any of these that takes a little bit less inference, that is a little bit more, more, more evident simply in the text as it's given. Instead of asking what is the connection between God's determination to tell Abraham of Sodom and Gomorrah uh, um, and to say Lot, the question I ask is this. What is the connection between God telling Abraham about what's about to happen in Sodom and Gomorrah and the fact, as the Lord says, that Abraham will raise his children in judgment and justice. Isn't that what he said? God said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do, seeing that he shall surely become a great nation, and the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, that they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. So he says that seeing that Abraham will do this thing, Will, raise his, will, will be this inheritor because he will teach his children of justice and judgment, should I withhold this from him? Perhaps the reason why God is telling Abraham of what he's about to do is because a part of Abraham learning to raise his children in justice and judgment is telling Abraham what he's about to do so that he and Abraham can have this interaction directly related to the nature of justice and judgment. That is a little bit kind of meta-thinking there, right? That, that, that God knows Abraham will raise his children in justice and judgment, and he knows that because he's about to have a conversation with Abraham that will actually help Abraham establish his mind as it relates to raising his children in justice and judgment. And that's what I think is happening here. It's, it's neither here nor there directly, but I think that's why the Lord questioned, should I do this thing, seeing that he will raise his children in this manner? Perhaps God is telling Abraham this thing to inspire the conversation and the experiences by which Abraham will truly learn the nature of God's justice, as we today are going to learn more about the nature of God's justice. So that in those days that are to come, when his son Isaac is born, this very conversation and the events surrounding the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah will be foundational to what Abraham will then be able to teach his son and so lead him in the way of the Lord. God is the great master weaver of time, Christian. Don't ever forget that. I can't tell you how many times I've had a friend randomly email me an interesting article or call and ask me about a, a topic or a subject, or a theological question that I've needed some time to dig into, only to need that exact information or that exact perspective on the tip of my tongue a week or, 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 or a couple of weeks later. Something which I never would have been thinking about or prepared for had I not had someone randomly email me some article that I read that inspired in me the direction of the course to be ready for this thing. Maybe even a better example is what our church experienced a couple of months ago. That in the summer, a family in this church asked if we could uh, pray over them and anoint them with oil as it relates to healing. 
And as the men of the church spoke of this thing, we decided that we weren't quite in the, in the place yet where we were confident to know exactly what, the, Lord, the, what, what, what the, the Word of God said on that and exactly how it is that we should go about that. So we, we began the process of study. And we studied for several months, thinking through uh, what that would look like, discussing it, uh, coming to some conclusions on it. And it was not but a week or two before we had finished our study that we learned about a more, much more pressing health need in the church, whereby we were then able to take that which we had learned over the course of that time and apply it immediately and directly to the need because the Lord had prepared us for the time that is to come. That's not an accident. That is the Lord weaving together times and seasons, preparing us beforehand as we are submitted, as we are ready to listen, as we are obedient to the will of the Lord, preparing us beforehand. And we can say the same thing about our building search, right? That's the confidence we have in this. The confidence that we have at this moment in time is the confidence that is rooted in the fact that we have seen God working and preparing, that God has been working behind the scenes, working in hearts, uh, bringing us even to the place of prayer and fasting a couple of months ago as a means by which to position ourselves, be ready for what the Lord is inevitably going to do. And this is how God works, as the great master weaver of time and of circumstances. God is telling Abraham, perhaps because he will lead his children in justice and judgment in light of what is being experienced on that day. So now let's see what God says about it. Verses 20 and 21. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me. And if not, I will know. God tells Abraham that the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great because their sin is very grievous. Now, we don't exactly know all the ins and outs of what this means. It is possible that this means the cry of those in the city regarding the, sin, the, the city's wickedness is great, but this seems very unlikely, and that for two reasons. First, because as we continue through the narrative, we'll find out that Lot was, more or less, the only man that would have ever even thought to cry out unto the Lord because of the wickedness of the city. The, the city was absolutely and abjectly subverted. So the idea that the cry of the Lord from the people of the city as it relates to the sin of the city, uh, that there were enough righteous people there to cry out unto the Lord, seems very, very unlikely. Now, the second reason is because we actually have some precedent for the idea that the earth cries out to the Lord over sin, or that part of God's creation that is in line with God's design cries out to the Lord when that design is breached. We've already seen this in the scriptures. Now, we, we'll, we could see it even more in the future, right? With Jesus saying that if we cease to praise him, even the rocks would cry out. With, uh, with the, the Bible telling us that creation groans and travails within himself to see the, 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 uh, the, 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 the bringing about of redemption, right? So we see New Testament precedent for the idea that, that creation itself is groaning under the breaches of the design of God and how they, that the world is operating outside of God's design through these things. But we actually have precedent in what we've already read in the book of Genesis. Remember, this is the first book in our Bibles. And if we uh, do allow ourselves, I, I do not recommend that as a general rule you say, I'm going to stay ignorant to everything else in the Bible as I read a certain portion. Nope, the Bible is the best commentary on itself. This is one cohesive book from beginning to end. Same author, different writers, but the same author, the Holy Spirit of God, from beginning to end to that end, it is all relevant as it relates to itself. But as we think about the purposes of Genesis, and we've said this several times, we, when we think about the nature of how we study Genesis, the purposes of what it is Genesis is trying to get across, the Holy Spirit would have anticipated the rest of the scriptures when Genesis was written, but the rest of the scriptures weren't written. So if God is seeking to do something in the book of Genesis for a person who only had Genesis, when we think on that bounds, we say, how is God introducing himself and then building upon what he's already introduced so that if a person is recognizing what God is introducing here, he is learning of his, of his God in this linear fashion. And recall that we have seen this idea of the ground crying out before, way back in Genesis chapter 4. Beginning in verse 10, or only in verse 10, the Bible says, um, the Lord says to, this is the Lord speaking to Cain. Cain. 
He says, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. So God confronted Cain and asked where his brother was, to which Cain said he did not know and asked that very famous question, am I my brother's keeper? God confronts Cain then and says that he could not hide from the Lord what was done because the very blood of Abel cried out from the ground. Now, why? Why would the blood of Abel cry out from the ground? Was it just because he was dead? Does, every single, does the blood of every single person in the world cry out from the ground when they die? Well, no. It's much more consistent with what we see in the scriptures that it's because of the injustice that needed to be righted because the image of God was defiled in man, and it was not the, the, the fact that, that Abel was dead that caused this cry, but it was the reality of the injustice of what happened that caused the cry. So that we might be able to presume that when there is injustice in the world, that that injustice is something which is noted to God, and in the way that, the manner that this is expressed, the fact that it cries out from the ground, that God is, uh, is, is deeply troubled and grieved by every injustice, and that every injustice must eventually be righted. Every wrong must be righted before God is satisfied. And this is why we call God a just God because God must right those wrongs, because those wrongs live before him as a breach of his character and his holiness, because he is just. We can go even further back to establish this idea. On the first day of creation, God said, let there be light, and there was light. And we talked about how God would not hand, uh, um, hang the lights in the heavens until the fourth day. So that we discern that when God said, when God made light, the idea was not just, well, it certainly wasn't that God made objects that illuminate because he didn't make those objects that illuminate until the fourth day. When in the first day he said, let there be light. But rather he established the order of light and darkness of day and night. He differentiated day from night, light from darkness. And in this we said, I believe that this is when God also differentiated morality, right from wrong. Because all throughout scriptures, we see that that is the picture of morality and immorality, right? Light and darkness. John chapter one, the whole epistle of first John, light and darkness. So that the creation of light on the first day is most likely rooted primarily in the creation of the moral and physical order by which the world operates. The physical boundaries, right and wrong, and of course, the angels who are described as being clothed in light. So that we can see that the whole of the created order is actually built upon the moral character of God. Thus, when that character, the character of God is breached in a direct way, such as Cain's murder of Abel or of Sodom and Gomorrah's tremendous depravity, of which we'll talk about next week, the very created world itself cries out to God to restore justice. We also saw how that it was for this reason that God established government in Genesis 9. Government was established as a human institution ordained both to identify and subsequently to enforce God's moral order, to punish evil and to reward good for the sake of establishing true justice upon earth. And when I say true justice, that word true is doing a lot of heavy lifting in our day and age. And it distinguishes from the false notion of justice that has now dominated, if you, if you hear anything in the headlines about the idea of justice, it is not justice as the Bible defines justice, it is a very different type of justice. When a modern cultural critic speaks of justice, they're espousing an idea that has recently been called equity. That there is no justice where there are not equal outcomes among all people and all demographics. And the idea of justice is elevated against morality. And this is how we know it is false justice, because this idea of justice, that everyone must experience equal outcomes in their life, is put up against or in contradiction to morality, so that if one must steal or destroy or even kill to establish these equal outcomes, they are willing to do so, and that is still, in that definition, justice. And that's how you know that that definition of justice is false, because it is not in line with morality. 
It is a false justice. The term for it today is social justice. And it is not of God. It is of the devil. We want people to be equal. We want there to be equal treatment. We want to recognize that the image of God is in every man. All of that is consistent with God's design and morality. But when equal outcomes is elevated above morality, so that morality is subjugated to equal outcomes, so that even if something is done immorally, even if cities are burned to the ground and people are killed, that's okay as long as we can achieve equal outcomes. And that's evil. That's evil to the core. That is not justice, as the Bible speaks of justice. That is injustice in every conceivable way. There is no justice in that philosophy. It is a mockery of justice. It is evil parading in the guise of justice. True justice is righteousness. True justice is not competing with morality. It is when society and individual operate in conformity to that which God has established and created to govern the universe. And by this, I don't mean the Mosaic law, though naturally the Mosaic law is a reflection of God's design. The Mosaic law is not the epitome of God's design, and we know that because Jesus wouldn't have had to come if the Mosaic law was the epitome of God's design. But the transcendent moral design that God has put into this universe that governs it by which all things are designed and by which all things operate. Justice is achieved when society and individual operate in conformity to that design. And when society falls out of balance, justice demands that those wrongs be righted. And it is for that reason that God has initially ordained government. And that is why the people mourn when unrighteous men rule. Because the people do not have the satisfaction of true justice in their society. And an unjust society is a society that is very unpleasant to live in. Justice demands that rights be wrong, uh, wrongs be righted, excuse me. Now, as we think through this, we thank God that Jesus Christ has satisfied God's justice and he has purchased our righteousness. What we could not do in conforming to God's moral expectations through our sin, Jesus Christ did do in his life. He bore our sin on the cross that we might be forgiven. For when we think about the idea of injustice, if we think about the idea of these injustices crying out to the Lord, the immediate thing that would run through our mind is, God help us, how can any of us be saved? Enter Jesus Christ. That Jesus bore our sin on the cross that we might be forgiven. And the King James Bible uses, the word that the King James Bible uses for this is propitiation. That Jesus' death was sufficient to satisfy the guilt of my sin, to bring about satisfaction for God's justice. So that Romans chapter 3, verses 23 through 26 tells us this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation, a satisfaction, through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. All have sinned, all have fallen short. You have, I have. There is none righteous. We are all worthy of, a, uh, of hearing those words guilty and being cast into a place of eternal separation from God in the lake of fire. But through the redemption of Jesus Christ, I can be freely justified. As we think all the way back to Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. It was not because of what he had done. It was because of the faith that he had. It was because of the relationship that he had with the one who is most gracious. God set forth his son to be the propitiation for my sin through faith in his blood. Jesus' death satisfied God's justice against sin. And when I trust in Jesus' death, that satisfaction is then declared upon me. And that is the word justification. And in this way, God can do two things that seem antithetical to each other, but are absolutely consistent through Christ's death. God can both completely be just 
He can satisfy every last imbalance of justice, but he can also justify me who has not lived up to his justice. And that's what God did through Jesus Christ on the cross, so that he is both just and the justifier of those who believe on Jesus. Jesus paid it for me, and thank God for that. Coming back to Genesis 18. The sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was so great that the cry for justice unto the throne compelled the Lord into dramatic action. So he came down to see for himself. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? God does not need to come down to earth to see anything. Does God need to inspect what he already knows in his omniscience? He most certainly does not. But this is something that we actually see happen quite often. This is a characteristic that we see semi-regularly that as a part of the process of God's long-suffering and righteousness and of his justice, he binds himself in a sort to man's limitations for the sake of man, for the sake of humanity, seeing and understanding what God is doing. God did not need to ask Adam and Eve where they were when they hid from him in the garden. He knew where they were. Why did he ask? He did not have to ask what they had done. He knew what they had done. He did not need to ask why they had done it. He knew why they had done it. God did not do that for himself. He bound himself to the limitations of mankind for first Adam and Eve's benefit to cause them to think through and speak through and acknowledge or not acknowledge their sin. And he also did it for our benefit so that we could see God walk through the process and we could follow the thought process of God as he walks through the ideas of justice and of righteousness and of sin. The same can be said here and in many, many other times throughout the scriptures. God will inspect this city through the two angels who are with him, not because God does not know what the city is, what's happening in the city, not because he does not know what's going to happen when the angels go into that city but for the benefit of we who read this account so that we know what's going to happen if those two angels go into the city. Yeah, we can just read, a, read the scriptures and God says, and Sodom and Gomorrah were greatly evil, so God rained fire and, 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 and brimstone upon them. Okay, we can read that or we can see the depravity or God can send a couple of angels to see just how bad it is so that we can read just how bad it is so that then we can learn what God already knew it's for our benefit so that we can see the depths of the depravity that compelled God to judge these cities the way he did. And it is here that we then see Abraham confront the Lord, verses 22 to 33. And the man, man turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Peradventure there be 50 righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for the 50 righteous that are therein that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Peradventure there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? In other words, for forty-five. And he said, If I find there forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he spake unto him yet again and said, Peradventure there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And he said unto him, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall be thirty found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Peradventure there shall be twenty found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet but this once. Peradventure ten shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communing with, the, with Abraham, and Abraham returned unto his place. So Abraham stands before these three men, and specifically before the Lord. And he asks a question. Wilt thou destroy the righteous with the wicked? 
Now again, to this point in Genesis, we've seen glimmers of this idea that God does not destroy the righteous with the wicked, in that God delivered Noah and his family at the least from this great flood. And we even talked about in that time the fact that Noah was the righteous man. We do not necessarily see uh, Mrs. Noah and uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and Mrs. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. We do not necessarily see their character, nor does it necessarily even come into play as it relates to that narrative, but only that, that, that Noah was righteous. And so Noah took him and his family and got into the ark. And we even talked about uh, some of the implications of what that does and does not mean as it relates to our lives. But we have not seen to this point anything quite like this. God chooses only now to truly establish his character on this thing. So Abraham says, peradventure there are 50 righteous in the city. Would you spare the city for 50 righteous? And notice here, it's not just, would you spare those 50 righteous? In this case, Abraham is asking, would you spare the entire city if there were 50 righteous men? And then the establishing principle in verse 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, that be far from thee, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. A just God does not slay the righteous for the sins of the wicked. A just God does not catch the righteous up in the judgment of the wicked because the judge of all the earth shall do right. Now, the use of the term righteous here is not the idea of sinless in, in, in the, the sense here. What this means is not that, that Abraham was anticipating that Lot among anyone in that city was utterly sinless, but rather the idea is righteous as it relates to the sin that is crying out before the Lord. That, that those that had not fallen into the sin for which they will be judged. There are many sins that we all commit for which God does not rain down hail, fire, hail, and brimstone, right? But the, the, the sins were so great upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and we'll talk about what that looks like next week and what those sins were, sodomy, that God felt he had to do this thing. And so what Abraham is asking is, if there is a man who is, not, who is righteous as pertaining to this, we could also talk about the righteousness which is in Christ and, and the imputed righteousness uh, and, and such uh, for, for what Christ would eventually do on the cross. And, and, and that may be in play here, but either way, the idea is those who are innocent of the, the sin for which you are judging them, will they get caught up? And this interaction becomes a case study in an establishing principle. God does not punish the innocent for the sins of the guilty. God does not punish the righteous for the sin of the unrighteous, but rather that God is a God of true justice. The soul that sins, it shall die. The man who sins shall face the consequences of his sin. However, notice also here that Abraham is not just asking for deliverance for the righteous man, but as we've said, Abraham is asking for deliverance of the city for the sake of, of the righteous man that if there are enough righteous men in the city, would God spare his judgment altogether on behalf of the righteous? And we've seen this principle somewhat, at least in passing in Genesis already also, haven't we? Several times, in fact, when we look through New Testament eyes. Remember back in Genesis 15 when God covenanted with, covenanted with Abraham to give him the land. And God told him when he made that covenant with him that for the next 400 years, Abraham and his family would be sojourners and strangers. They would even for a time be indentured to another people, but that at the end of that time, specifically in the fourth generation, God would raise them up and give them that land. And God's reasoning in Genesis 15 verse 16 was this. In the fourth generation shall they come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God says that he would give Abraham the land, but there was a reason why he was not going to give Abraham the land in that day. And as we talk through it, it would be some 400 years because the land had not yet gotten to the point that where it was so pervasive with sin, so filled up the cup of God's long suffering, so it overflowed into God's wrath that he was ready yet to judge because God is a long suffering God. We might be able to even see the same thing in Noah's day. Why was it that it was only Noah and, those, and, and his direct family that were on the ark? Why did God wait that long? Well, because perhaps unto that point, God said, I will spare all of civilization on behalf of those righteous that are there. And so we've seen this. 
The same principle here. Abraham is asking God to withhold his judgment from the entire city if by chance he would find but 50 righteous left. And God responds affirmatively in verse 26. If he finds 50 righteous, the whole city would be spared. Abraham then begins to press the point, right? He goes down to 45. And the Lord responds in verse 28, if I find 45, I won't destroy it. Abraham keeps pressing. What about 40? God says, for 40, I'll spare the whole city. Abraham says, what about 30? Petitioning the Lord not to be angry as he's pressing. The Lord says, I will not do it if I find 30. Abraham then says, what about 20? The Lord says, for 20, I won't destroy it. Abraham says, in a final act, what about 10? Surely there's 10 righteous in that city. God says, if there's 10 righteous, I'll spare the whole city. Now, we can look upon the fact that the city gets destroyed because there's certainly not 10 righteous left. And we could say maybe Abraham could, should, should have kept pressing the point, whatever. But the fact of the matter is this. How amazing is it that God would have spared the entire city for 10 righteous? This tells you something about the interplay between God's justice and God's mercy. We know of God's justice. We learn of God's justice. We will see God's justice. But it also tells us of how, just how merciful God is. So the Lord, uh, we, they get down to 10. The Lord leaves. Abraham goes back to his tent. So on that day, a principle was established. And I, not a legal principle per se. I don't think that we can say across the board with confidence, as long as there are 10 righteous in any place, right? 10 is the, the golden number. As long as we can find 10, I don't think it's that way in any city or state or nation or whatever it might be, or church. I don't think that's the point. But a principle is established nevertheless. God is just. God will judge sin. But he will not judge the innocent for the sins of the guilty. God is merciful. God will judge sin, but he is abundantly willing to delay his judgment upon the guilty on behalf of the intercession of the innocent. And throughout the Bible, we find this time and time again. Moses has said in Ezekiel to be a man who stood in the gap between God and the people of Israel. In Ezekiel's day, God said, I sought for another man among them who would stand in the gap, and he found none. No man who could actually stand in the gap, who was righteous to intercede between God and his people as it relates to judgment. God has always sought for that man. God has always desired that man. God is looking for excuses to show mercy. But eventually, the cup overflows and justice must rain down. All of these pictures leading to the final intersection, however, the picture of Moses interceding between Israel and the people, the pictures of the prophets of Jeremiah, of Ezekiel, in their day asking the Lord Daniel, particularly praying and interceding for his people, all of these pictures point to a final intercession, don't they? whereby Jesus Christ does not just delay God's judgment against the guilty, but that through the payment of his blood, he secures absolute pardon against the guilty. His righteousness, paying the debt for our unrighteousness. The final man who truly stood in the gap. And as we apply today, I'd like to boil all of this down to one Abrahamic statement. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? The implications of this are varied and dramatic, more than we could possibly consider today. We could think through any number of avenues and, and outcomes as it relates to this idea that the judge of all the earth will do right. Think on what it might mean for you and I today, however. It means first and foremost that God must judge sin. And if God must judge sin, then I need a savior. And Jesus Christ is that savior and indeed my only hope. God must be just, and a just God must punish sin. And so there are two options on my shelf. Attempting to satisfy God's justice in myself, which is a fool's errand, which is an impossible task, and one which, if this is going to be my strategy, will end up with me heaving under the righteous judgment of a holy God. Or I accept Jesus' propitiation on my behalf and trust that Jesus satisfied the wrath of the Father, the justice of God, on my behalf.
Because there's not one sin in the history of history that will fail to be judged, Christian. Because God is perfectly just. But the principles of Genesis 18 can take our mind in any number of other directions as well. It's a part of our overall conviction at Legacy Baptist Church that we hold to a pre-tribulational uh, idea as it relates to end times events, that God is not going to include his church in the last day's events. And one of the reasons why is because of this principle, that God does not judge the righteous with the wicked and the judge of all the earth will do right. And to be quite honest, even if you do not share a pre-tribulational perspective, even if you're one of many in the broader church that believe that the church will live through the tribulation of those days, we can at least share this confidence and this hope that regardless of where God places us in those days, the judge of all the earth will do right. He'll do right by you. He'll do right by me. He will do right by everybody because he will do right. And so I can be satisfied. I can be confident because I serve and follow the judge of all the earth who will do right. And if the judge of, the, of all the earth sees me going through that time, this is what I would know. It is not because I'm being judged with the wicked, because the judge of all the earth will do right. It's also a comfort for we who live in the United States in 2024, isn't it? That the judge of all the earth will do right. That while Christians most certainly suffer under the persecution of evil men, which is not the judgment of God, but the sin of men. And under the natural effects of sin of this world, which is not the judgment of God, but the effects of sin upon the world. To the extent that God actually judges our people for their sin, we can rest assured that the judge of all the earth will not destroy the righteous with the wicked. Because the judge of all the earth will do right. And it may mean that which was in Abraham's mind on this day, that God will spare the whole group. May it be that we are among those who are right with God and intercede before God for our church, for our families, for our nation, for our, our world, for humanity, so that we might be among those that God could point to and say, for the sake of those righteous, that righteous remnant, I will show mercy upon all. I will give more time. But when it is the case, as in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, that God's mercy must give way to judgment. Well, we'll see in the coming weeks. Though there were not 10 left in the city by which God would be willing to spare Sodom and Gomorrah, before that city fell to the flames of brimstone and fire, Lot was still brought out. Because the judge of all the earth will do right. And so we think of the various implications of this principle. Maybe there's many other implications which I have not necessarily laid out here, but the Holy Spirit of God is placing on your heart on this day. That's good. That's what I want to happen, right? That's what should be happening. But the Spirit of God is, is doing His work in you through this principle that we are thinking through today. And all these things can be of a comfort to we who heave un, uh, under some sort of fear or suffering. Of course, we are not persecuted as much of the church around the world is persecuted today. But there's one other way that we might be struggling that this principle can help us. Maybe it is that you heave under some true personal suffering, whether that's illness or injury or difficult circumstance or whatever it might be, finances. And you're tempted to believe that God is somehow judging you. And I speak this directly to born-again believers today through Christ's finished work. Now, we know from Scripture that God chastens His children. And it's not outside of God to bring into our lives elements of difficulty as a means by which to refine us, to teach us, and to draw us to Himself. That's a part of what a good and loving Father does. He uses circumstances to bring us to the end of ourselves so that we will come in line with Him. This is discipline. But God is not an arbitrary God, Christian. Nor does God operate under some sort of petty system of punishment. Jesus was already punished for your sin. You have already accepted that. He is the propitiation for your sin. You are under the blood of Jesus Christ. As we think about the nature 
of sin in our lives. And we say, why are these things happening to me? Is it because of my sin? Well, the thought process takes us in a couple of different directions. The first thing that we think about is, well, is there unconfessed sin? And if there is unconfessed sin, then the Father, as a loving Father, might be bringing things into your lives to discipline you back to Himself, and that's a possibility. But here's what I've seen many times in a Christian walk. I've seen someone who's going through a hard time, and I've sat down with them, and I've asked them about unconfessed sin in their lives, and they said, I don't. I, I, I don't have any of it. I, I, I've, I've searched my heart. I've, I've been genuine before him. I've asked the Lord to help me understand. But maybe, maybe there's sins that I don't know about that God is just hammering me for. God gave us a very big book, Christian, to tell us about himself. And more than that, in this economy, he gave us of his Holy Spirit by which to lead us into his word and into his way and to illuminate our path. It is inconsistent with the nature of God in the scriptures, the God that he's told us about, for him to be standing in the heavens laughing as we are groping around for the sin that we simply cannot find that we're committing, not telling us what that sin is, but punishing us for it. That's not the God that we serve. The God that we serve is a God who, if you are sinning, will tell you so. The Spirit of God will convict your heart the word of God will make it so. So that it is not the case that you will be being under chastening, heavy chastening for a sin which you simply cannot find, which you have eagerly sought the Lord for and you have prayed and you have begged and you have sought counsel and you have sought to the word of God and you can't find anything, but God must be punishing me for something. That is not the character of, of God. The judge of all the earth does right, Christian. And so that I can step into confidence on that day, that if I'm going through a hard time, but I have cleared my conscience of all sin, the Spirit of God communing with me and me communing with the Spirit of God, then there's something else God is doing. And that's okay. Refining, testing, bringing something into my life so that I might be able to help someone else that's in need in a few months, years. And this is all a possibility. But it doesn't always fall back on sin. Because God is not an arbitrary God. It's plausible to believe that a child of God living in stubborn, unrepentant sin would suffer the consequences of his rebellion as a loving father draws him through discipline back to himself. Proverbs 3 and Hebrews 12 makes it very clear that God does in fact do this toward his children. He brings trials into our lives to help us bear fruit. John 15 tells us that those that bear fruit, he purges them or prunes them that they may bring forth more fruit. If you're a fruit-bearing Christian, expect God to prune you back. And it's not going to feel good because pruning is the process of cutting off live stuff. You don't just cut the dead stuff off, right? If you want your plants to grow healthy, a lot of times you're cutting off stuff that's alive. You're pruning it back so that it can grow healthier next time around. The Bible says those that bear fruit, he purges that they may bring forth more fruit. So there are reasons why God is doing what he's doing. He brings trials into the lives of those who are bearing fruit to make us better. He brings chastening into the lives of those who are rebellious to call us to repentance. But it is impossible that a child of God, even if his sins are the same 70 times seven times, but who lives in the spirit of humble repentance and regular confession is being punished by, the, by God for sins which his son bore on the cross. And we know this because the judge of all the earth will do right. And may God comfort and exhort us with these words this morning. Again, perhaps you're here today heaving under some weight or fear which is not yours to bear. Perhaps you've lost sight of the character of God and you truly feel as though God is standing in the heavens with a lightning bolt just waiting to zap you or you felt as though God has been zapping you. And you've forgotten that the judge of all the earth does right. Perhaps there's another area of your life and godliness which the Holy Spirit has brought to your mind today beyond that which I've suggested this morning where God is reminding you in that situation, in that circumstance, that you can rest in confidence that he will do right. One way or the other, may this phrase be the one that we carry with us today. May our hearts be comforted and compelled to make sure that we are right with him so that on the day when he does, we find ourselves under his mercy because the judge of all the earth shall do right.
Thank you for listening to Pastor Jamin Wickler from Legacy Baptist Church in Buffalo, Minnesota. More information about Legacy Baptist Church and a library of sermons are available at www.legacybaptistchurch.net.